Welcome, everyone. It's wonderful to see so many of you here. Thank you for tuning in to the final panel of the three-part speaker series, Resilience, Recovery, Repair, hosted by May We Gather in collaboration with Tricycle and funded by the Asian Pacific American Religions Research Initiative, or APARI. My name is Funi Su, or Funi Chi, and I apologize that you are not able to see me right now. I was trying to avert technical difficulties, and then I created some. So I'm here. <laughs> you just can't see me. I'm here in spirit and voice. I'm one of the co-organizers of May We Gather, and I'll be moderating today's panel. Thank you all for taking the time to join us today. And thank you also, a big, big thank you to Aaron Straley and Johnny Rondawa for helping with the tech. Today's session is going to be 90 minutes, which will give us time for three short presentations as well as Q&A. Like the other two events in our series, today's panel is going to be recorded. And we're going to be sharing all three videos with registrants at the end of our series. So keep an eye out in your inbox for that message. We're also going to be posting these recordings on our May We Gather YouTube page. Can you all see my slideshow? Okay, great. May We Gather is a collaborative project of commem commemoration and healing by and for Asian American Buddhists and their spiritual friends. In 2021, we organized a national Buddhist memorial ceremony on the 49th day after the Atlanta spa shootings. This year, to mark the three-year anniversary of the shootings, we're organizing a national Buddhist ceremony and pilgrimage in Antioch, California on Saturday, March 16th, 2024. You can learn more about the pilgrimage and register for in-person attendance on our website, www.maywegather.org. The event is also going to be live streamed for those of you who wish to attend virtually. Building on discussions generated from the 2021 memorial around racial and religious erasure and recovery as they relate to Buddhism, the Resilience, Recovery, Repair speaker series offers insights into the historical and contemporary contexts that shape the upcoming May We Gather pilgrimage in Antioch. Our series brings community elders and leaders, acclaimed historians, archaeologists, educators, and spiritual teachers together in conversation to reflect on 19th century gender and immigrant experiences, folk religion, and spiritual life, as well as contemporary projects of restoration and repair in California and beyond. In our first event of the series, Resilience, a story of the 19th century Chinese immigrants in Antioch and beyond, with Dr. Jean Felser and Lucy Meinhardt, moderated by Dr. Duncan Rukin Williams, we learned about how the anti-Chinese violence of the 19th century was interlinked with systems of violence enacted against indigenous peoples and black Americans, and how these systems are part of a racial karma that continues to affect social dynamics today in Antioch and across the United States. In our second panel, Recovery, the History of America's Early Budo Daoist Temples with Drs. Trey Mei Ho, Bennett Bronson, and Jonathan H. X. Lee, moderated by Chen Xing Han, we learned about the Chinese temples and shrines in the 19th and early, early 20th century America and the people and the practices that sustained them. We also discussed these temples within the broader historical climate of anti-Asian animus, as well as the efforts of communities to recover and preserve these sites as a form of cultural work. In today's panel, Repair, A Path to Healing Land and Ancestors, we're joined by esteemed panelists Karina Gould, Christine Cordero, Devin Berry, and Noliway Alexander. In this final panel, we're going to be weaving connections discussed earlier as we bridge the past and the present while building spiritual friendship. In particular, we're going to be returning to the idea of interlinking connections as a Buddhist framework for situating Asian American Buddhism in the larger history of America's racial karma. Understanding the marginalization of Asian American Buddhists both helps us better see the nuances of racial and religious animus in the US and determine the broader patterns across these systems. For instance, journalist Art Jonke provided just such an example of these patterns in his 1985 Boston Magazine article, The New Racism, Indo-Chinese Refugees Are the Newest Victims of an Old Boston Legacy. In it, he detailed the brutal stabbing of Vietnamese Buddhist refugee An Mai, who was killed at his Dorchester home on Coleman Street by a young white Marine. Moreover, Jonke further noted, 
The Coleman Street killing occurred just over one year and one mile from the infamous firebombing of three Black families at 36 Melbourne Street. Worse, that same house at 36 Melbourne was at the time of the Coleman Street murder, occupied by another Vietnamese refugee whose car windows had been smashed three weeks earlier. So while the police and settlement agencies searched for a motive that would seem less abhorrent, others saw the murder as the latest episode in Boston's legacy of racist violence. By emphasizing the interlinking connections, we also recognize the real realities of settler colonialism and the fact that the early Asian immigrants were coming to lands and sacred places that many indigenous peoples had been displaced from and to a country shaped by racial enslavement. Here again, we're grounded by some of the connections made by Dr. Jean Felzer in our first panel, including from her work, um, her more recent work on understanding California as a slave state. We're also gonna be thinking more about the idea of culture work. Dr. Jonathan H. X. Lee discussed this idea in relation to the descendants of the early Chinese immigrants who worked to repair community temples and recover lost histories and practices through their own meaning-making practices um, and endeavors. To the right is an example of culture work from the Buddhist temple or the moon room at the Orville Chinese temple. On a historic Chinese temples trip organized by Hannibal Tobbs, who so generously invited the May We Gather team to attend, a number of the participants were intrigued by the inclusion of what is labeled the Tangfo Lo Buddha or the restaurant Buddha. If the name is unfamiliar to you, it's because it's named after the Chinese restaurant that it resided in. It was also called Charlie's Chop Suey in English. When the family sold the restaurant, they donated the restaurant Buddha, as it's known, uh, to the Buddhist temple, lending another layer of significance to the temple as a site of culture work and ever expanding meaning making. In many ways, Asian American Buddhist recovery at large is um, itself culture work. Instead of simply honoring the past, it provides opportunities for, and in fact requires new meaning making. For example, for the May We Gather 2021 ceremony, we commissioned a, a ceramic lotus from the artist John Okamura for a Kintsugi repair ritual that spoke to the intentions of our memorial. Thinking of Asian American Buddhist recovery as cultural work enables us to imagine Asian American Buddhist repair so that it also includes an acknowledgement of our communities as complex and varied positioning in the structure of settler colonialism. We can also imagine Asian American Buddhist acts of repair in ways that support the repair efforts of other communities we're interlinked with. One way, may, one way that we as a collective, may we gather, has endeavored to do this is by being in conversation, such as through this panel, um, and being in conversation with other communities that have suffered racial and religious harms, and by thus cultivating spiritual friendship. So today we're gonna to be hearing from guests who have been healing land and ancestors through their work with the Asian Pacific Environmental Network, the Sagaria Te Land Trust, and the Deep Time Liberation Program, respectively. I found their efforts of repair to be deeply meaningful and inspirational. And it's really my great honor to be introducing our esteemed speakers today. So I'm going to introduce each speaker before they give their presentations and we'll have time for Q and A at the end um, of our 90 minute program. Again, you're welcome to submit your questions using the Q and A feature at any point. Let's begin. Christine Cordero was raised by a Filipino immigrant family in the working class town of Pittsburgh, California and acts from the deep belief that we're stronger together and co can go farther together than we ever could alone. She's co-director of Asian Pacific Environmental Network, organizing with immigrants and refugees for a healthy environment and thriving economy for all communities. For over 20 years, Christine strategized, organized, and built coalitions across environmental, environmental health and justice, workers' rights, and economic and racial justice issues. Previously, she was executive director at the Center for Story-Based Strategy, training 2,000 plus people and working with 200 plus groups to reinvigorate narrative strategies for social justice. Christine is also an ordained priest of the Chosen Ji line of Rinzai Zen and trains in Oakland, California and Kalihi Valley, Hawaii. She holds a BA in linguistics from Stanford University with a focus on language and power. 
Thank you so much, Funi, for that uh, generous intro. Um, thank you for inviting me here and to the rest of my co-panelists. It's so lovely to be in conversation with old and new friends. Magandang hapon, umaga gabi. I saw that there's a good afternoon, morning, and evening. I saw there's folks from all over, um, which is lovely to see. Uh, so my name is Christine Cordero, and I enter this conversation through a couple of uh, strands, I guess I would say. First is that where the event is going to happen next month is right next door to where I grew up. So I grew up in Pittsburgh, No H, California, as Funi just said, which is a small, multiracial, multiethnic, working class town um, that is literally right next door. Uh, our high schools were rivals with the Antioch High School, uh, which we may be walking past. I don't know for those that will be at the event. Um, not sure if we'll be physically going there. But I grew up in a big family, um, big Filipino immigrant family, lots of amazing food, several generations. We used to dance cha-cha in our living room um, and eat lots of good food. And I grew up with about 20 first cousins and whatnot. Um, so big immigrant family, was raised culturally Catholic. Uh, and what I didn't know at the time was that I also was in a community that was in the shadow of um, kind of power plants and industrial sites that honestly were just kind of part of our landscape growing up. So there would be things like, um, you know, the the air would be so bad that they're supposed to tell you that the air is bad outside and you should go inside. And the only reason I remember this is because um, several of my cousins and friends were into muscle cars and they would be like, ah, oh, crap, the air's, the air's bad. We got to cover it because it would strip the paint off our cars. And I don't think anybody was really calculating what that air would be doing to, you know, our, our human bodies or, or the land. And so I would say one entry point is Pittsburgh. There's a lot of beauty there. And there's also a lot of things that um, I learned about things that I thought were normal about my own health history and my family that I realized later that I was part of, unfortunately, a club of frontline environmental justice communities, communities where um either the land wasn't valued or the people and they cited hazardous sites there um, or they put them there and didn't care about the people anyway, or they were the only land cheap enough for us to go to. So that's one area I go to, um, to this conversation. And I would say the health and environment um, background, I started to come into consciousness and that's actually how I got into the Dharma path, which is my other um, entry point into the conversation. Um, I have long since even before I knew what an organizer was, which is, you know, somebody who fights for social change. I think I've been an organizer since I was in high school and uh, came to it just from my surroundings. I uh, knew a lot of things were inequitable and really noticed um, that things were unfair and tried to make those changes, like getting, you know, classes that we needed in our high school so that we could be competitive for college. Or, you know, there was a lot of anti-immigration laws at the time that I was in high school. And so I was a huge organizer um, activist for about 20 years, at which point I was in a deep cycle of burning out um, constantly. It's like going hard and then burning out, going hard, burning out, um, and have, have been loved that work, but also at some point was like, this is literally going to kill me if I keep going at this rate and at this speed. And I actually need to learn how to be differently in the world if I really want to serve out in the world. I came through like, you know, yoga and Shavasana at the end of yoga to beautiful mindfulness, such radically inclusive mindfulness at East Bay Meditation Center. And then I eventually um, found the Zen lineage at Chozenji um, International Zen Dojo in Hawaii. And really the practice for me was about things that felt true, that I learned were true, about things being connected, um, about uh, the Bodhisattva path, which I had no idea there was already a name thousands of years old for what felt like a calling in my life. Um, and all of those just felt true as I continued to learn about the Dharma um, and Buddhism, even though my background is in Catholicism and Filipino work. And one of the things that I um, really was grateful for when I came to the dojo in Hawaii was, um, you know, we sit, we sit our meditation zazen, uh, we're actually facing inward and our eyes are open. It's not even a soft gaze. And we kind of are inviting in senses and the full 180 and doing kind of, you know, the breathing 
that most of us do when we do in our practice. And the invitation is actually to be in collective um, awareness and to pay attention and to see the opening. So I was actually training at a lay mon- at the lay monastery at the dojo when um, I had already had a career in social organizing, social justice work. I was living in Hawaii and I was consulting at the time because I had gone through my last burnout cycle and was trying to find a new way. And I was doing consulting work with folks in Louisiana when Hurricane Ida hit. And there was this moment of, oh my gosh, climate and environmental disruption, which I had been working on for decades, was really at a whole new level. And when Hurricane Ida really damaged a lot of Southeast Louisiana, and I was in deep relationship with these folks, there was this part of my practice that said, oh, like... What am I doing living in Hawaii, doing work in Louisiana, when actually a lot of what I have to give is where I grew up in this land that that raised me in the Bay Area? And I honestly felt the call to come home. And that's how I ended up at APEN, Asian Pacific Environmental Network, and this idea of I love this place. And a lot of a lot of times for me, environmental climate justice seems like this big thing. For me, it is a very simple thing of knowing a place I love, knowing where it stands on the clock of the world of how it's contributing to environmental and climate injustice, and then what I can actually do to to try to save, not save, but rebuild right relationship with this land that raised me. Because I was was born in San Francisco and raised in the East Bay, um, not in the Philippines where my parents are from. I also feel deep connection there, but that's not where I happen to, you know, all the social forces made it possible for me to do this work. So APEN, which I would love to show you all a few pictures, if that's all right. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Oh, I am disabled. I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to keep going. Um, APEN is Asian Pacific Environmental Network. We are a 30-year-old organization that has been organizing with Asian immigrant refugee communities for clean and healthy environments so that our communities can thrive. Ooh, ooh, maybe I can do pictures. Here we go. Let's try. Um, One second here. All right. Let's see if we can do this. All righty. Can folks see this? Yeah, I'm seeing a a nod from Noli. Thank you. So APEN is 30 years old. Um, These are some pictures I just wanted to show you and bring into the room several of our members, a lot of them who are no longer with us, but some are. Um, We're a 30-year-old organization um, who has worked with Laotian immigrant refugees who've lived in the shadow of the Richmond Refinery um, in California, which is the biggest oil refinery west of the Mississippi. Um, And a lot of um, Laotian immigrant refugees were were placed there. when they were fleeing the secret war in Vietnam. Uh, so here we go. Just a picture of the intergeneral, ne- intergeneral nature of our work. This is Brandy, family. This is a very early picture of one of our oldest organizers, Torm, pointing out all the different things in Richmond um, that are there. A lot of our members are very active in their home language, their heart language in fighting for the uh, communities we want. This is an old picture of us um, fighting for a multilingual warning system in Richmond, which I can talk more about in a second. Um, A lot of our folks who, especially our recent immigrant refugees, often have very close ties to the land in ways that I think folks raised in modern Western might not be. Um, A lot of our early work were folks recognizing the health impacts on their own bodies and on the food they were growing and on their babies. Sleep on saying, you could see our stuff here. We um we've done a lot of work. Uh, this is I love this picture of this family. This family is great. The twins, uh, Alita, um, oh I'm forgetting your sister's name. Their their mom and this aunt. Um, this is a whole intergenerational family of some of our APEN members. Uh, this is also us at the land. So I'll end. I'll I'll end here. Um on the pictures and just say, I wanted to show you all a little bit of that. Um, Have I stopped sharing screen? I just want to make sure. (laughs) Yeah. Can folks still see this? All right, I'm gonna assume I'm not sharing screen anymore. Wonderful, I've stopped sharing. Thank you, I appreciate the the response. Um, 
So I'll just spend my last several minutes talking about some of those pictures. Um, you know, we've 30 years worked at the Laotian immigrant refugee community, 20 years in Oakland Chinatown, preserving a uh, very, as many folks know, generationally, historically rich area that as tech boomed, um, we were really trying to preserve the communities there. We're also in the South Bay of LA um, with a lot of refineries, freeways, a lot of the same health and environment impacts as the communities we've worked with for decades in Richmond and Oakland. I know it's interesting, and, and I, 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 was, I was sharing this with some of the panels when we were talking earlier, you know, working with communities means that we aren't broken up into the silos that a lot of folks think issues should be worked on. So some people will be like, environment's over here, housing's over here, spiritual work is over here, you know, that kind of thing. And one of the things that's deeply humbling and grounding about working in community is folks come as whole people to the table and um, in in service of their communities and their families and wanting to change their own lives. And so for us in both our in both um, Chinatown in Oakland and in our Laotian immigrant refugee community, we know that some of our folks are Buddhist, but we're not ever explicitly organizing within that framework more than we're we're making space for everybody to come to the table as their whole people and to be like, what is needed in community? What does it mean to make home and be in right relationship to the land and each other? One of the founding core principles of APEN has always been solidarity because we have never been under the illusion that um, our communities can do what we need for our communities alone. So for instance, when we won that multilingual war warning system, um, I was sharing that it's very common in, in towns like this, um, whether in the United States or around the world, that um, you know if the air is bad and you send out... Um, warnings, they were only going out in one language, <laughs> which in a community like Richmond, where there are multiple languages going out, um, how incredibly detrimental that was to the health of so many kids and families. And so when we fought for that, we knew that wasn't just for our Laotian immigrant community, but was for all of us that were living there. And one of the things that I think has become abundantly clear through the pandemic, right, is that we breathe the same air, li literally breathing the same air, drinking the water, like nothing Nothing is 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 these straight containers that everybody wants to separate into. And what does it mean to live that interdependent life? I feel like we try to do that at APEN, and it's part of our work to say, how do we be in close relationship with groups like Karina's and the Segorte Land Trust and be very mindful that we are not on land that is just blank spaces, right? That folks have lived here and stewarded and been in relationship with the land and each other? And how do we actually respectfully fold into that? How do we do our work always in community? And we've been asking ourselves, what makes a thriving community, right? Like, even though we're known as an environmental justice organization, for us, it's about what, what jobs do people need to take care of their families? What transportation does somebody need to get to their doctor's appointment, right? Like, what do we need to take care of, of our kids um, and the education they're getting? And really thinking about that none of that work happens in isolation. So we often think about um, how our work builds and is while we have that central focus of Asian immigrant communities um, that we own we know that we're within a larger net um, and tapestry. And as a part of that, you know, we especially in the Bay Area, we we do a lot, especially in the last several years. I mean, the the whole purpose of the gather, the original gathering, right? When there was a big anti Asian hate moment, um, we have been since trying to do healing story circles intentionally between our members and of other organizations in Oakland, specifically that have brown and black communities that are also organizing um, for the health and thriving of their communities. We have been um, talking about what does it mean to have community spaces that can be resilience hubs into, during, and out of climate crisis, right? When the wildfires are raging and we cannot breathe, where do we go? Where do we refrigerate our medications? Where do we run those machines that keep our folks alive? So I am excited, I'm gonna wrap up here. I'm so excited to explore that and share that through, you know, the lens of the work that I do with APEN and my own path, in being back home here in Contra Costa um, and next to this beautiful, rich history that exists um, just a town over is how do we think about ourselves within a larger context? What do we have to do as ongoing practice, not a destination for the way that we are living together to be in right relationship with all living beings, the land and each other? 
what is the depth of spiritual friendship and solidarity needed in these times of increasing chaos, climate disruption, and deep division? Um, I'm happy to kick off and pass it to the next folks. Excited to be in deep conversation with all of you. Thank you so much, Christine, for sharing a snippet of the wonderful abundant work that you're doing and emphasizing the ways that APEN and you and your own practice really highlight and view healing and repair of the land through this interlinking focus. One of the first public memorials that I went to after the Atlanta area shooting was an APEN organized memorial in Oakland Chinatown. And I remember when I was there thinking like, oh, APEN is sponsoring this. And I just thought like, that's so interesting because I know them as doing environmental justice work and so it was so wonderful to see that APEN does this kind of interlinking, that that they're not working in silos, as you mentioned, that you're thinking about the connections to other areas of life that help people thrive, as you mentioned, but also working with other communities. And so I want to segue to our next speaker, um, who you mentioned, um, Karina Gold, and introduce Karina so she can talk a little bit more about her work. Karina Gold is the tribal chair for the Confederated Villages of Lashan Nation. And Karina was born and raised in the village of Huchen, now known as Oakland, California. She's the co-founder and lead organizer for Indian People Organizing for Change, a small native-run organization, and the Sagaria Te Land Trust, an urban indigenous women-led organization within her ancestral territory. Through the practices of rematriation, cultural revitalization, and land restoration, the Land Trust calls on Native and non-Native peoples to heal and transform legacies of colonization, genocide, and to do the work our ancestors and future generations are calling us to do. Thank you so much for inviting me to be a part of this beautiful gathering today. Um, I spoke to you in the first language of the East Bay. Chochenyo is the language of my ancestors. My great-grandfather, Jose Guzman, was one of the last fluent speakers of the language. And the language is waking up again uh, through my daughter, Deja, who is the language keeper for our tribe. There, um, and, and I think that one of the great things about living in the Bay Area is that now it's so full of rich uh, cultures and different people that live here. and But sometimes we forget that the lands that we're on are the lands that were inhabited by many other people before other folks got here. I'm going to show a slideshow because I hate being a talking head and I think pictures are worth a thousand words. And so I'm going to um, share some photos. Um, and let me get this up to here. This is a picture of Tuyushtak. Tuyushtak is our creation place, a place where we believe that not just the Lashan people were created on, but the Bay Miwok people and the Delta Yokut and the uh, Patwin people and the Plains people uh, were on top of. The Confederated Villages of Lashan Nation is a confederation of all of those tribes there. Tuyushtak was this creation place and uh, for thousands of years, only our most holy people could go to the very top to do ceremonies for everyone um, uh, for many years. And then other people came to this land. And when they came to this land, they renamed everything. And, you know, um, and so this particular mountain, the mountain of creation for so many tribes in the Bay Area, went from being Tushtak to being called Mount Diablo, uh, the Devil's Mountain. And uh, so it went from a place of reverence to being called the Devil's Mountain. And that internally changes people and their and their interpretation of who they are sometimes when those things begin to change when settlers come to our land. I tell you this because our whole life changed when other people got here. And many times we don't really understand whose land are we on? Where are we coming from? Why are we here? How did we get here? We don't ask our question, but who was here first? What was the language that was spoken on the land before anyone else got here? 
I still live in my traditional territory, traditional territory of Huchun, one of many of the different territories in our um, our land. And um, I'm blessed to be here, to have an unbroken tie to the lands that we have always been um, created to take care of. But now we share this territory with other people that have come here from other places that have other uh, belief systems and other ways of eating foods and traveling. And it's a blessing to be here to in this rich area that has always been one of abundance. We believe that there was always an abundance on this land. We were created on this land to be a part of it, to take care of it, to watch over the waters and the lands. Um, and we did that for thousands of years before other people got here. Terrible things happened in our territories. The Spanish missionary period came and I'm a recovering Catholic because I understand the um, the pain that of that part of the history of my people, the enslavement of our people, the stopping of speaking our languages, the taking away of our sacred. All of those happened during that 99 period, 99 year period that the Spanish missionary uh, were here. And then there was a rancho period where our ancestors were free um, from the missions, but free to go where our lands were then parceled off to folks that were in um, the, this um, war between Spain and Mexico when Mexico won its independence. And shortly thereafter, America took over these lands and called it California and a gold rush came and there were laws that allowed people to hunt our people down. All of those things happen and yet we're still here. Um, and that's the blessing. This map is a map of our traditional territories, the Lashan people. Um, and in the middle is Tiushtak, this brown area. And so we still have the relationship to the land that has been unbroken, relationship to the waters that are here, and are working with allies and accomplices to take care of this land and waters in many different ways. We've started off the work that we've done um, uh, by taking care of our sacred sites, our shell mounds, the burial sites of my ancestors that have been here for thousands of years that are now unseen by the naked eye underneath railroad tracks and uh, BART stations and apartment buildings and schools and bars lay our ancestors' remains. Um, and we started doing education in the Bay Area probably in the late 1990s uh, 90s when the um, the internet blew up and that's what it allows us to be all in this space together um, and allowed us during COVID to actually come together as community to talk to each other in many different ways. I'm going to skip through some of these things because I want to talk about rematriation. Rematriation is Indigenous women's work Rematriation is to restore a living culture to its rightful place on Mother Earth, or to restore a people to a spiritual way of life in sacred relationship with their ancestral lands without external interference. And this is what's important about external interference. You see, with all the changes that happened in the Bay Area, people coming in, all of the things that happened historically to our people, what ended up happening um, was that we became homeless in our own homeland. We actually had to ask permission from park districts and from private landowners to have ceremony. We did not have a place that we could call our own. Ohlone people is the generic term, became homeless to, in their own homelands, meaning that we became renters that we are not homeowners, we are not business owners, that we um, are having, we have had difficult time having connection with our land because many times it's cheaper to move outside of this place that um, is one of the most expensive places in the world to live. Um, so without having external interference, meaning without having to do a song and dance routine, without having to ask permission, to be on our own lands, to have our own prayers. Um, and so that's what that means. I always like to stop and, and really explain what that means. 
As a concept, rematriation acknowledges that our ancestors lived in spiritual relationship with our land for thousands of years and that we have a sacred duty to maintain that relationship for the benefit of our future generations. This uh, taking care of the land is not just our responsibility anymore. It's the responsibility of everyone that now calls this their home, that we have a responsibility to ensure that the land is here for the next seven generations. And for the next seven generations, they have fresh water to drink and good air to breathe and a relationship with fire. We started working on the West Berkeley Shell Mound um, about eight years ago when it was about to be developed. The, eight, the West Berkeley Shell Mound is the oldest of all the Shell Mounds. There was 425 of them that ringed the Bay Area. This was the first place that our ancestors created a village and a burial site. We were fishermen. We had Thule boats and Thule houses, and our village sites were large. It was always where fresh water met salt water, where the marshlands were so the Thule can be harvested. And this place in Berkeley on 4th and University looks like a parking lot. It's never been developed on. It's a place that my ancestors continue to rest underneath the asphalt. And a developer wanted to build on top of it. And we called out to our friends and community to come and help it. And so here I'm standing with indigenous women leaders as we're trying to, um, to come together to lay down prayers for the West Berkeley Shell Mound. But it's not just an indigenous place anymore. It's a place where people from communities all over the world have come to pray together. This is our first arbor in our territory in 250 years, a place where we have um, had one of we have not had one of these structures um, that allows us to pray um, without out without external interference. This. Uh, Arbor is in a piece of land that was first given to us in 2017, a place in deep East Oakland, where we gathered logs um, and harvested them from a place up in um, Sonoma County and brought them and many people from all different walks of life helped us to skin them and to sand them and to ready them to go up. And during, um, while we were getting ready to put this together, we uh, planted hundreds of tobacco plants and white sage, our medicinal plants that we use in ceremony to give away to dance. But COVID hit and we weren't able to dance it in in that traditional way. We were still able to have ceremonies here. Um, we had graduations here, birthday parties here. We had fires for our relatives that passed away. And I, bar I married uh, my daughter and her husband um, in this arbor during COVID. And so this has become the, the heart of our people again, a place that we have without that external interference, a place where we could have ceremony again. Imagine having to wait 250 years in order to have this happen in your own lands. Um, we've been doing a lot of work around the West Berkeley Shell Mound, and I kind of wanted to focus on this because the West Berkeley Shell Mount has become this place in the Bay Area where people from all walks of life, no matter what they're working on, have found a way for us to integrate it with each other. People are working on different kinds of issues, but the West Berkeley Shell Mount has called us together to find a place where we don't have to disagree with one another, but we can agree upon taking care of this one place that should be left alone. In eight years, we have gathered people by the hundreds to come and interfaith prayer circles to create artwork on this space, to, um, to lay down prayers um, for all four in all four directions. That people that are Buddhist and Christian and Jewish and um, uh, Muslim can come and pray together. We have had Aztec dancers and Korean drummers uh, Tibetan chanters and Hawaiian singers all here in the same place, uh, laying down prayers for this sacred site that is over 5,000 years old, a place that we should, as human beings, recognize that the First Nation people of this land should have a place to pray 
without that external interference. We've stood together um, for many, many different uh, years now um, to do this work of protecting the sacred site, acknowledging that um, all people have a right to have that place um, to connect to. As we see these dancers here, they represent folks from um, the Aztec traditions dancing here. And we had many other folks that have come and done the same thing. But Native people also have a connection. I'm sorry, this picture is a little fuzzy. They have a connection with the Nippon Mahoji Buddhist monks. They walked across the United States with American Indians in 1978 understanding that there was a mission that would bring us together. Their Fuji Guruji, who was their leader at the time, um, asked them to always work with native people. And there's a reason. They walk for nuclear proliferation across the world. Every step is a prayer um, to stop those, dis those destructive things from happening, those bombs that are created. But what their Fuji Guruji told them was that the um, uranium that was used to create the bombs of Hiroshima and Nagasaki was taken from native lands. And for that never to happen again, that native people and Japanese people should work together to encourage uh, the world to stop the destruction. And so they have walked with us through to our shell mounds. We had created shell mound walks that started in Vallejo, California, and we walked down to San Jose and up to San Francisco, walking 20 to 24 miles a day, stopping mm -hmm. at shell mounds that were underneath parking lots, railroad tracks, houses, schools, laying down our prayers, asking our ancestors to remember us mm -hmm. as we were remembering them. We were visited by uh, leaders from the Amazon that prayed at the West Berkeley shell mound with us. And we have a group of folks that um, come and they offer prayers at the West Berkeley Shell Mount, putting up flowers and prayer signs and flags um, uh, monthly almost. Um, and um, doing those traditional things that help to lighten up this, uh, this shell mound that has been gated by the owners. We ask people to come and pray at this place because our ancestors have prayed for all of us for thousands of years. We believe that our world, um, which is here in the Bay Area, um, was created by the prayers of our ancestors, that there's an abundance here, not just in resources monetarily, but in thought and in movement, that the Bay Area is this place where ideas come from, critical thinking, movements that help to change the world. And that that movement and this bubble that they say the Bay Area is, was created by the prayers of our ancestors thousands of years ago. That we can continue to see this place that we now call home with abundance. That there's a place for everyone that lives here, as long as they live in a, in a way that wants to give a lot more than they receive. This is our vision for the West Berkeley Shell Mound, a place for people to come to actually see the top of uh, a shell mound, a place where poppies grow and we open up Strawberry Creek, a place that we have an arbor and that we can tell our histories and our stories of resilience, a place that we hope that all people can come and continue to offer their prayers and to learn and share with the Lashan people. We started the Segurite Land Trust because of all of that sacred site work. The sacred site work of protection brought us to these uh, places of not just protecting our sacred sites, but the lands and waters that are also connected to us, that we ha have became whole again, whole as a tribe and whole as a people that continue to work with us. Indigenous people from many different walks of life work at Segurite, bringing in their traditions and cultures and language and food to share, but also to share with everyone else that now lives in our territory. To remember as human beings what it's like to put our hands in the ground, to change and to recognize 
that pe first people are here, the Lashad people, but that we share this place with everyone else. A dream of having places that are culturally relevant in our territories, a place where we can continue to share this work with everyone, a place that we can grow together to remember and to build a place that the Lashan have men been for thousands and thousands of years, a place that we continue to grow with our elders and our youth, and a place that we continue to grow with all of you. And so I just wanted to thank you for this time that I've had to talk to you about the things that we've been doing and hoping to grow with all of you um, in the work ahead. Thank you so much, Karina, for sharing not just the realities of colonial displacement and genocide, but the personal impact that has, and also the resilience and the survival of the Lashan people in the face of that reality. Um, it was really when I happened across the work that you're doing around the West uh, Berkeley Shell Mound and the revitalization of that area that I, I felt that it became even more clear that the work of Asian American Buddhist recovery and repair needs to be done in partnership so we can help not just talk about and highlight Asian American Buddhist historical sites and temples and shrines, but to do so in conjunction with our communities that are inhabiting the same areas that we are and also have been engaged in this long time work of recovery um, and repair and to do so in this kind of spiritual friendship that we're trying to collaborate on. So thank you so much for, for sharing your personal history around that and offering that as a type of um, friendship for us to connect with. I'd like to now move on to our last speakers. Um, we have two of them, so I have two bios to read. Um, I'll begin with Devin Berry. Beginning his practice in 1999, Devin Berry's meditation teaching is rooted in the Buddha Dharma and mindfulness daily life practices. Devin has trained with mindfulness-based stress reduction, the East Bay Meditation Center Commit to Dharma program, Spirit Rock's dedicated practitioners program, and Insight Meditation Society's four-year residential retreat teachers program. Devin started some of the first mindfulness programs in San Francisco Bay Area schools. And before retiring from youth work, he acted as a frontline advocate for marginalized youth living on the streets and led wilderness camp programs for teens rites of passage programs for tweens, and a summer camp for boys. Devin is co-founder of the Teen Sangha and Men of Color Deep Refuge Group at East Bay Meditation Center in Oakland, and is co-creator of Deep Time Liberation, a healing journey that explores the impact of ancestral legacy and intergenerational trauma on Black Americans. He is passionate about the power of witnessing and storytelling as a liberation tool. Devin is a father and teaches nationally. Noliwe Alexander has been a student of Vipassana meditation for over 20 years. Throughout this time of deep devotion to the Dharma, Noliwe has become a dedicated practitioner, meditation teacher of various retreats and sitting groups, belongs in class series programs, and she dedicates her Buddha Dharma practice and teachings to the BIPOC, LGBTQIA+, and at-risk and elder communities. She's a graduate of Spirit Rock's CDL4 program, EBMC's Commit to Dharma program in 2010, and is a graduate of Spirit Rock teacher training from 2017 to 2020. Noliwe is the founder of Peace at Any Pace Incorporated, a nonprofit organization that offers a journey to healing from intergenerational and ancestral trauma retreats and elder and youth programs, which are exclusively for people from the African diaspora. Noliwe is a wisdom keeper and humbled by the presence of her ancestor's spirit that lives within and walks beside her. Thank you. Thank you. Beautiful introduction. As you can see, I'm kind of on the screen by myself. Um, Devin right now is teaching a retreat at Spirit Rock and they have very spotty internet signals. So he may be in, he may not be. So I think I'm going to have to uh, begin without him and hopefully he'll join us in a little bit. Um, thank you so much for the invitation to be here and to discuss deep time liberation. But first, let me just say, Again, um, I am, um, as I always start my presentation or anything that I speak to, I am the daughter of Marge and Larry. I am the granddaughter of Maggie, May, and Sydney. 
and Laverne and Elizabeth. I am a wife, a mom, I'm a grandmother to Jeremiah and Calvin, the loves, loves, loves. And in the tradition of African American life, I am also an auntie. I'm an auntie to many, seen and unseen, not necessarily blood relatives, but I'm an auntie in the world. So it's a pleasure to be here. I just needed to name many of these folks that I named are my ancestors, and I don't go forward without making sure, much like Sankofa, I need to go back in order to go forward. So thank you for that. I'm going to talk a little bit about Deep Time Liberation, our actually genesis of how the work got started, and where we are now, and the intersections in which we are working on healing the trauma of the wounds that we have been inherited for so many um, centuries. Deep Time Liberation actually was a beginnings <laughs> with Devin Barry, uh, co-founder, and myself, I wish he was here to actually kind of, we do a great uh, uh, going back and forth on, on how we began this process. But uh, in 20, 2009 and up to 2010, Devin and I were in a program at East Bay Meditation Center um, um, called Commit to Dharma. And I first met him there, didn't really know him very well, but I could say that he was a serious practitioner. Um, and then again, we met again in 2010 for, commit to, for Community Dharma Leaders for at Spirit Rock. And there was something that happened that, that brought us together as quote unquote buddies. They kind of created a buddy system and he was my buddy. And as we were talking about what was next for us, he said he was going to go and do a long meditation at IMS back in Barrie, Massachusetts. But before he was going to go to a friend's plantation and do some work there. Um, in 2010, he did a program called the Roots Retreats through the Technot Han community. And this was part of his journey, trying to his, his his, I don't really want to speak for him, but his grandfather was, as he calls him, a kin keeper. He had the history of his family. And if you know anything about African American families here in the United States, it's not easy to keep those records and to have those memories because for many, many reasons, right uh, until 1860, um, we weren't listed, of course, on any of the census reports, only as property and not by name. So he was a kin, his grandfather was a kin keeper and he stepped into that role himself. But during this process, he really was kind of working with how do I sit with whatever is arising in me and the dominant culture in these institutions and in the institutions of the Buddhist communities. So he did this work in 2010 with the roots and he also did a, a, a program with going into a slave cabin and actually sitting there. He has a beautiful picture. I wish we can show that to you. I don't have any pictures available with him sitting really in deep meditation and doing metta in the slave cabin overnight. You can imagine how profound that was. And then together in 2013, um, I think it was 2013, we came together and did some work around healing trauma with in East Oakland here. And we were asked by two um, psychologists to come together and work with them. It was a program called Healing Trauma and Overcoming Stress. And we were working with 17 African American grandparents who were the sole caregivers of their grandchildren. And you can imagine what that feels like. I know as a grandmother myself at a particular age, it's very difficult energetically, um, uh, financially, all the things to be a caregiver of a, of a small child or even up to an adult, especially given the conditions in which they were beset, which was basically having to parent given addiction, prison, um, this um, uh, separation from, from their own children and then the children separating from, from them. Um, 
we did this work and I think it was incredibly impactful for both of us. We kind of came together and saying, there needs to be some work done here around this healing, this healing of the trauma that, that we live with that we don't even know as oftentimes we talk, seen or unseen. The other thing we did um, together is we did a, um, a sojourn with a group of people from the Technon Han community. And we went to, um, this was in 2016, we went to Louisiana. It was called the Roots Retreat. And from that point, honestly, we were able to see how this can unfold for us. And really great thank yous to Lynn Fine, who was one of the organizers of the Roots Retreat in uh, Louisiana, Devin and I were participating in. And we had the opportunity to walk onto a plantation in Edgard, Louisiana. It's called the Whitney Plantation. And it's the only plantation in the United States that actually honors the life of the enslaved and not the life of the slaveholder. From that point, he and I looked at each other and knew that we were going to be needing to do some work around healing the wounds of our people. We then began to think about how can we do a presentation and so we contacted East Bay Meditation Center and from there we did several programs kind of using the work that Devin had done in his, his own journey using some of the work that we had come up with and learned from the Roots Retreat. And together we put together a program in which we entitled Deep Time Liberation. This is actually the, um, the name came from Devin himself because how deeply he felt this work. From that point, we actually did this work for BIPOC people. And what we found, and I'm gonna be incredibly honest and transparent here, we found that what we didn't know, we just didn't know, we didn't know the experiences of the AAPI individuals, of migration, um, folks coming through different levels to the United States and the trauma that they also endured. But what we did know from a deep, deep familial level, we knew the trauma that we were holding on to and at some level couldn't necessarily release. And so after doing this program with East Bay Meditation Center, we began to see how could we take this out into the world and actually begin to bring people into the fold of deep time liberation. Because our goal here with DTL, which is the acronym, is for the liberation of people from the African diaspora, from the chains, the, the colonization, the colonized minds in which we have been infused century after century. So we had our first retreat in 2018 and we brought together another core member, Dara Williams, who many of you may know from the Dharma world. She's also a psychologist living in back East, working with trauma for the people, for BIPOC individuals. And Rosetta Saunders, who's a incredible drummer and a person who's really working with with African um, veneration. And so our first retreat was in Louisiana because we knew that's where we were going to be uh, doing our work. And we got together 15 people and we took them on this journey and we call it a healing journey because unlike, this is really unlike any other journey or any other type of healing work that I have seen. It's taking people into the depth of their trauma, allowing them to hold that as grief, allowing them to see their ancestral roots as a byproduct of this epigenetic form in which we carry in our genes, the trauma of the past of slavery, of Jim Crow, of the great migration story, of disenfranchisement here in the United States, North, South, and whatever, and we chose to go to the South to do this work, to, to the Southern part of, of the Americas, because this is where many of our, our roots are from. Our first retreat was in 2018, 
And boy, did we learn a lot. <laughs> we learned again, just like we did at East Bay Meditation Center. We didn't know what we didn't know. But we learned exactly what it felt like to see people begin to unearth these wounds and begin the work, and it's difficult work, to actually heal. We planned another retreat in 2020, but unfortunately COVID hit us. And so from that point on, we pivoted, we did some online retreats, and now we're back on the land. And currently we're doing this incredible work, these retreats, we call them healing journeys again. They're eight day retreats in the American South. We do New Orleans, we do South Carolina, specifically Charleston, which is the largest slave port for 60 to 7% percent of the enslaved Africans who came into America landed there. And we will be doing in 2025, we'll be doing um, an in-person ancestral retreat in um, Montgomery, Alabama and Birmingham, Alabama, and going to the Peace and Justice Museum. So this work, it, it really is repairing. It's in, interesting that we're in this particular section of May We Gather because what we're doing is we're looking at the fragments that we have been sitting with and many of us not knowing. You know, we're responding, we're reacting to things that we're not quite sure why until we actually have to uncover and open ourselves up to see the, the traumatic experiencing that has happened from our ancestors until our present time. We also hold together this incredible container so that we can really hold grief and somatic experiencing and healing all together. We're looking at this intergenerational process that is so common amongst those of us of color, those of us from different backgrounds, but yet the same experience of the traumatic um, holding that we do, whether it's fight, flight, or freeze, or collapse. This collective way in which we're working is not on an individual basis. We are not sitting in a silo, in a retreat center, looking for liberation. We're actually doing it as my teacher and good friend. We're really, look. Larry Yang says, we are finding liberation together. This way in which we are taking this as much more of just a process of moving through um, what our ancestors did and calling their name, but we're actually creating a movement, a movement of transformation from within. We use much of the Buddhist tenets of the Brahma Viharas as a foundation for us, because without compassion and without that sense of, of love and, and forgiveness, and the sense of being able to hold it all through an uh, equanimous mind, but also coming out the other end with joy, because what we do is we also open up a portal to see that healing is possible as a reflection and a kind of looking back in how our ancestors did it, whether it was in church, whether it was stick pounding, whatever it was, whether it was shout, praise houses, we did it with resilience and with joy. We came out the other end. And many of us haven't, and this is the work we're doing. Um, let's see, I'm trying to see where we're at right now. We are really starting to create a bridge of this intersection between suffering and resilience between the interconnection of who we are, the, the mere idea of how we sit in the elements and taking none of that for granted. 
We're looking at expanding our programs and really extending it out to more facilitators coming in so we can work in collaboration with other BIPOC communities. Mm. And I have been, as it said, you know, been around for a little bit, <laughs> looking at my own watch of my own time, but I recognize that this is some of the best work that I have done because it's not only healing those who come to us, and they're coming from all over the country and some from um, internationally, but it's also healing all of the facilitators who are doing this work. So it's such a pleasure to be able to speak about it, to talk about the genesis, and to know that this work is carried forward. And it's carried forward not just, this healing is not just for us, it's also for our ancestors who didn't have the capacity or the ability to heal themselves and to the healing of future generations. So thank you for allowing me to speak about Deep Time Liberation. Please look at our website. It has much more information on it. And thank you for allowing us to join you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Nolly Way. I think I can speak for many um, participants in the audience right now when I say that learning about deep time liberation is just such an emotionally, I'm, I'm struggling to find the world, word because it's not wonderful since you mentioned the grief that's involved, but it's really hopeful. I think that's the word to, to hear about you and Devin and your work with the participants at Deep Time Liberation and going through something like grief and trauma together um, and being able to go through it with the intention of healing and building community. Um, it, it's really cliche as it might sound, inspiring and, and hopeful hearing that there are people doing this kind of work and same with what Karina is doing and same with what Christine is doing. And I'm sure that we have a lot of members in the audience who want to ask you all about your experiences. So I'm not going to take any more time. Let's turn to questions. Um, if you have a question, my reminder is that you can put it in the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen and we'll answer them as we receive them. Okay, so the first question from Anu Gupta. Hi, Noliway, thank you for sharing the Genesis story of DTL. It's truly inspiring. Could you share DTL's long-term vision and how we non-Black folk and or Buddhists can support the ongoing healing and liberation efforts of our Black kin? Thank you, Anu, it's good that you're here. Thank you so much. Um, our long-term vision is actually to do some weekend collaborative work with other BIPOC folks. Um, in order to do that, we're needing to do a little bit more education ourselves and some training for people who, for information and, and, and histories that we don't have. And then to be able to use some of our template around the honoring of the ancestors, really calling our ancestors in and doing the deeper work around the trauma that has we've all experienced. The second question is, how can you support the ongoing healing and liberation efforts of black folks? Hmm. I, I almost uh, don't like to use the word ally because I think that that has been an overused and almost a trite word right now. But much like you're working a new right now is this is if we can really be anti-racist and really stand in the fire and not shrink back when we see any of our BIPOC folks being marginalized or having violence beset upon them. If we can stand in that fire and really in this period of waking up, that's the kind of support I think we all need. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you, Nolly Way. We have another question. Um, and Anu said, I like the word relative and not ally. So we have another question from an anonymous attendee. 
And this person is asking, how important is the purposeful use of particular language to describe past experience of your ancestors with colonizers, settlers, kidnappers, plunderers, etc.? How important are land and lineage acknowledgments? And how can they be made more meaningful and less perfunctory and performative? I'll take the second part of the question because it's about land acknowledgments, but I think we could all talk about the first part of that question, right? Um, so thank you for that question, anonymous person. Um, you know, I I always love that uh, question about land acknowledgments, and this is what I'll say. Uh, land acknowledgments absolutely mean nothing unless you're going to take an extra step. So when people come to Segurite Land Trust or the tribe and they ask, can you do a land acknowledgement or can you give us the words to do a land acknowledgement? We're like, no. First of all, why are you doing a land acknowledgement? What does that even mean to do a land acknowledgement? Um, and I'll tell people, it's like, it's like saying the Pledge of Allegiance. We all said it when we were growing up and then it was we said it by rote and we don't know what those words are. We're just saying, them, right? And um, so we don't want that. And so it has to come, if you're gonna do a land acknowledgement, it has to come with action items. What are you going to do? It's about building a relationship, right? So if you um, were creating a land acknowledgement, we created a beautiful land acknowledgement with the Berkeley Repertory Theater. It was a visual land acknowledgement and it's three stories high, right? But it didn't just stop with a mural on their building. They're also inclusive of how do we get together and bring young people in to look at what is theater, especially BIPOC kids that have no idea or no uh, access to it, right? How do we bring them in? Maybe it's not about doing the acting, but what's the backstage stuff look like? And giving access in those kind of ways, spaces to actually meet in and to talk about different kinds of subjects. You know, there's different ways that you can do uh, land acknowledgement and that it shows also what you're saying. You're putting to be behind your words, you're putting actions. And so that's what it is. So it's not profound. I can't say that word. It always messes me up. But you're not just saying it and wrote that you're actually trying to build a relationship with the first people on whose land you're on. The second part of it, I say you use all the words that are real words, right? People came in here and they murdered our people. They came in here and they brought rape and they brought murder and they brought slavery. Um, and so we don't talk about slavery in California in terms of Native Americans, but California was built on our backs of free labor. Um, and so there's uh, all of those things that happen and to whitewash that language um, is what really causes us to be in the place that we're in today with ethnic studies being um, uh, attacked, with our uh, cultures um, not being taught still, with us, what I call a white paper genocide on our people only being taught in fourth grade history and then forgotten again. And so I say that we use all of those words that, um, um, that really say and speak to what happened in our histories. All right, thank you, Karina. I would the only thing I would add on that is a uh coming from a people that are thrice colonized in the last, you know, in, in recent memory. Um, one of the things that I, I think we absolutely need to name, and part of what I think is powerful about the practices that a lot of folks come to this space with is the ability to see things in front of us for what they are, right? The thing I will say about the colonizer is I would be careful when people get caught in the labeling of themselves as anything, because what I haven't been taught in my practice is the fundamental ability for us to choose and change. So while is it is important to name what has been done in the past, I caution people on staying attached to, because people can get stuck in their guilt, right? Around being like, so I lived in Hawaii for two years active sovereign fight of the Kenaka Mali, yeah? What does it mean to be a settler colonial of brown skin in those in that place, right? And I think if I had gotten caught up in being like, I'm a settler colonizer, that actually erases my agency to be like, how do I be in relationship right now that I actually can choose differently to be in relationship with the Aina and the people, right? 
And so I would, I just would be careful because like, for me, if anything, that's what the practice tells me is to get bigger than myself, right? And so anytime we get caught up in the like, what's the label of me that says I'm a good person or I'm this or those people were good or bad can get dangerous. So I, I just say in 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 the application in the current sense, like if it's an excuse to skirt accountability, no, say the word, understand the word. But as far as our ability to move forward, don't get stuck on the word, Right. Like actually the actions are what matter um, in the same way that you said about the land acknowledgement drives me up the walls. People are like, how can I help? It's like, yeah, it's more than saying. Thank you so much. And actually the next question goes to you, Christine. This is from Tootsie P and Tootsie's asking, how can we learn more about Chosen Ji or Rinzai Zen? How do we start learning or practicing this way of life? Thank you. So one, I'm definitely not an expert. I am a humble new student. Um, Choseng.org is a very good place to start. Um, it's a 50 year old. So in the, in, as far as Buddhist lineage is actually a young temple, um, but we're um, in Hawaii on Oahu. And it is very much within the context of Hawaiian Japanese culture. And I love it because it's a mix of meditation, martial arts, and fine arts. So it's very much about learning and self-development and enlightenment through the body. Um, definitely start at the website. I would say also, I don't know where you are, Tootsie, but I tell folks to start where they are. That's the one thing we we are not about um, uh, spiritual tourists. <laughs> uh, any kind of deep spirituality, right, is a practice and about depth. And so I tell people, like, there's a way to be in right relationship. And you could definitely look on the website to see. There's also going to be, I think, several books um, being released by folks that uh, train at our dojo um, this summer. So there, there will be um, more information, but there are a lot of places to train. One of my favorite quotes from a, this is a Musashi quote is like, all ways are one in the end, or there are many ways, right? So I would say start there. There are lots of books, lots of things online, and also happy to be in community. I um, I serve here out in uh, Mishan Ohlone, Oakland area, but um, there are many, many wise traditions and peoples all over practicing good stuff. Thanks, Christine. So anonymous attendee, uh, maybe a different one, I'm not sure, has not a question, but wants to thank all of you um, uplifting, powerful women for bringing us so much inspiration. I second that. Thank you. Not all heroes wear capes. And then another anonymous attendee says, hi, folks, could you share your reflections on the current moment and the backlash against diversity efforts nationwide? Where are you seeking comfort? I just want to speak a little bit to this. Maybe it's off point. I'm not sure. Um, a lot of things that we're seeing today that is happening, not just, and, and it's, it's pretty intense with the erasure of um, whole histories. But this is not new, folks. When we see just recently in Tennessee, um, SWAT stickers and people marching with, with um, SWAT stickers, uh, signs and so forth. This is not new. When people say, oh my goodness, did you see so-and-so got killed? This is not new. Did you see, oh my goodness, so-and-so got uh, lynched? This is not new. It's just so much more evident now because we have what's called a phone and we can now broadcast it you know, even um, more profoundly. But even the erasure of education is not new. And so I don't know if I take, I don't even know if I can reconcile it and haven't for the many years that I've been on this planet. But I just want to say that it, it, we have to take this up. If this is something important to you, then you need to each one teach one. We can't just depend on school systems to do the work. We need to create a, a type of environment in our homes that teach our children. And yes, you know, you, I think um, Karina said it prop, you know, in fourth grade, you all of a sudden, and then there's nothing left. There's no other types of teaching. Find the teachers who are brave enough to go ahead and, and speak. 
and in the homes make sure that our history is not erased. So I don't find comfort at all. I find that it is an ongoing perpetual um, violent tendency that has always been lashed against those of color. Thank you, Noliway. We have about a minute left and we have one comment and one question, I think there, oh, maybe the question disappeared. Let me share um, the comments. This is from Susan Dexter. I suggest that land acknowledgement is a form of education, expanding the general understanding of the history of the land and normalized recognition of theft. Um, since we have a little bit of time, just want to see if maybe there were some thoughts around that comment or if uh, another question pops up, we can wait for that too. Um, I see another comment from Susan. Most of my community has no idea that they live on unceded Wabanaki land. To keep that message spoken and heard has to, has to elevate consciousness. I see what you're saying. And it, it does, it, um, in some places, it could prove to be an educational forum, a way to begin a conversation. But I think that you can't just say a land acknowledgement and then move on, right? I think that the land acknowledgement, you have to say it and say, and this is why we're saying that, right? We're acknowledging. You know, for me, it's sometimes it's like, we acknowledge that we're on Lashon territory that and that these people were uh, enslaved and marginalized and all their land was stolen and they're still here. But what does that do for a person hearing that at the beginning of a conference and then having nothing else that has anything to do with the Lashon people? Or you say the same thing about the Wabanaki people or any other you know, people that were, were created here on Turtle Island. It has to come with the follow up, right? We're saying this, there's, there has to be an education. The city of Berkeley created a beautiful land acknowledgement. And they're one of their um, council members spent an entire summer reading everything, really coming into right relationship in her own mind about what that meant and then followed it up by having an hour presentation that was created by the tribe to, to really do some education. And then there's some pieces that were kind of left on the side. There should have been a link on their website still. There's more pieces that have to go with it. And so if you're going to do this a land acknowledgement by creating this spark in people's mind, it's like, oh yeah, but where are those people now? What are they doing? What was that first language? And how do you get involved in making sure that we don't replicate history by erasure? And so um, I see it as a point, a jumping point maybe of education, but it has to go further than just saying the words. Unim, if I may, I just thank you, Karina, for that. Um, and just for the, I was struck by the pattern or just the theme I hear in not only your and Devin's work at DTL and, and Karina with the shell mounds, how deeply important acknowledgement and memory is as a rooted way to act forward. And that part of what is painful, and I, I, I think, I don't know if Mushim is still on this call. I was talking with my wonderful spiritual friend Mushim the other night, and we were talking, we we're looking at this logo that talked about how Folks can stay in a cycle of aggression when trauma and hurt happens if there is no acknowledgement of grief, of grievance and harm done, right? And that we keep trying to get to justice without proper acknowledgement. And what does it mean for each of us to decolonize our in our, our own minds, our own histories? And for me, as somebody who's, that's going to be very difficult to find my family lineage through, you know, centuries of colonization, but I'm going to try because that's my thing to carry. That is the part I do in order to make myself be able to act forward. Um, and how deeply important, very simple things are, but they are not necessarily easy. They might be simple, but they aren't easy to do. Um, yeah, appreciate y'all. Thank you so much, Noli Wei and Devin in the Internet Ethers, Christine and Karina for being in 
what Christina has called right relationship with us um, or um, for being part of our, may we gather efforts at creating a kind of right relationship with broader community in the Asian American Buddhist recovery and care work we're trying to do. Um, from the bottom of my heart mind, I want to express my gratitude and um, I want to thank everyone who's joined us today, taking time, especially people on the East Coast, who I know it's nighttime for you all now. And I just want to remind everyone, if you want to rewatch today's event, that we'll be sending out the links to the recording for this event and the other ones in a follow-up email. And um, all of the events in the series are free and open to the public. They'll also be posted on our YouTube, as we mentioned later on. And if the audience would like to support today's speakers. You can lo learn more about Karina, Christine, Devin, and Noli Wei's work through the Sagriate Land Trust webpage, the APEN network, uh, APEN webpage, and the Peace at Any Pace website. And you'll find the links in the chat. And then finally, last thing I want to say is for those of you who want to attend the in-person pilgrimage in Antioch on Saturday, March 16th, please register on our May We Gather website. And for those who wish to join virtually, we'll have a live stream available. Thank you, everyone, and good night.